Hey family, I wanted to say thank you so much for watching this video for your hobby or your career goals. As an educator who likes to refer to himself as a sharer, my goal is to give my way to success. I'm gonna give my way to success. And if you know me, you know that my two life mantras are what I know, you know. My goal is to have one impact. If I can help someone, my living is not in vain. So I've decided to base the entire educational side of my brand purely on a donation system. Yes, a donation system. And as a person who loves to share, I never want to have to make teaser videos where I give away some of the information in order to sell the rest of the information just to try to make a living like this. Okay, so let's take it from the top and put it all together. So we've got... And so for that last chord, you want to check out the full tutorial on my site for only $19.95. <laughs> Seriously. So to cater to the type of person that I am, I'd rather just give all the information away and base the entire system on a donation. This way I can focus on just pouring out the information to you with no hesitation. So here's how it works. To help me to sustain the process of making these videos, which requires hours of production, recording, and editing time, and to help me to sustain my living while doing it, I'm asking that you make a donation every, say, three to five videos or every video if you like in one of a couple ways. Now the one that would mean the most to me is probably the easiest for you to do. And that is to donate 99 cents. Yes, 99 cents for each video where you learn something new or where it helps you in your process. The way that you can do that is by downloading one of my songs from one of my two sites, either my personal site with my original music or my performance track site that features hundreds and hundreds of instrumentals and backing tracks. This way is something easy to afford and I get a chance to have a home in your music library. The other options are via my Patreon account, or by PayPal or Cash App. And you can donate as little or as much as you want, as often as you want. Again, I know it might seem crazy, but I'm convinced that for me, this is the way to go because of the fact that I'm releasing and will continue to release daily videos, giving away as much information as possible, education, expertise, or just crazy ideas for what they're worth. And if not, at least share the video with as many people as possible to spread the information. That would help my overall goal as well. So again, thanks so much for watching the video. Subscribe and hit the notifications button so you can make sure you see the daily videos that I release. Thanks a lot. Take care. All right, and we're back. So this is round two of this uh, click track, the production of this click track, um, hired by Ricky Dillard. And I believe that's the name of the song. <laughs> Um, sorry, this is only the first time I've heard it doing this click track for a client, but, um, what we're doing here is we're now getting ready to mix this track. So if you watched the previous video, you saw the full production of this track. And if you didn't go watch it, it's just version one of this, uh, producing a click track and hired Ricky Dillon. So. The thing that I want to do here first, I brought all the tracks in already. Um, I'm going to put the the tempo 87. And the thing we want to do is go ahead and get these tracks prepared for mixing. So the first thing I'm going to do is turn down this master fader. And this is honestly not characteristic of what you want to do as an engineer. <laughs> The only reason why I'm doing this is because I still haven't figured out how to get my volume not to be as loud uh, being recorded to my QuickTime player. So I just have to do that for right now to be on the safe side. What I'm going to do is take all these tracks. These are my uh, my individual instruments and I'm going to make a group out of them. And I'm just going to leave it at group one because I won't have any more groups here. And I'm going to take all these down. And the reason being is because we're getting ready to do the VPEC formula. And if you don't know what the VPEC formula is, don't worry. I just started talking about it recently. 
it's my own personal um, brand or labeling of minimalistic mixing, how I mix. I'm a minimalist when it comes to mixing. I'm not a Grammy award winning engineer. I did go to school for audio engineering, um, but because I divide a lot of my time between making music, producing, being a live musician and being a studio recording engineer. Uh, yeah, my skills are at a particular level where I like to approach mixing from a minimalistic standpoint. So the VPEC formula is volume, panning, EQ and compression. And, you know, that's even a, a you know, a seasoned Grammy award winning engineer would tell you that those are the most important aspects of mixing. Um, it's just that my mixing is pretty much completely tailored around that. And of course I do added effects and that kind of thing, but yeah. So volume painting, EQ and compression is where I focus and where I try to teach and help other people to focus as well. So the first thing we want to do is to get a volume mix. Before I do that, however, I need to make this a longer track. So let me highlight everything. And this song, the actual original song I saw was four minutes and 55 seconds. I'm going to make this um, about, five, you know, that amount of time. But I won't really actually have to worry about like, to be actually honest, I could actually leave this as a 10 second song. Like as long as you see this. And the reason why is because it's a perfect loop. So I could make it where, you know, when people pull this up or when the client rather pulls this up in their um, player of choice, iTunes or something like that, it'll just automatically loop endlessly. But because of the fact that they may also be re uh, pulling it up in a recording software such as this, I'm going to extend it. And let's just see what 25 repeats gets us. Okay, so I actually kind of nailed that the first time. I just took a guess. 25 repeats gets us here at almost 4 minutes and 47 seconds. Now I need that longer than that, so what I'm going to do is undo that. I'm going to, whoops, sorry. I'm going to undo that, and then I'm going to do it again, but this time I'm going to do 30 repeats so that it goes past the 5-minute mark. I'm not worried about minutes as I'm worried about repeats because these are all just loops, a four bar loop. And I basically want this track, even when it's played for this long, I want it to have the ability to be put on loop on repeat. And then it just play right from the top endlessly in groups of five minutes at a time. So with that, now it's time to get this volume thing going. And what I first want to do is organize my track by priority. So those that know how I mix, I usually put my master fader in the middle, but that's when I'm working with other instruments besides just percussive instruments. When I'm working with harmonic instruments like pianos and guitars, this is just the click track. So I think I'm just going to leave the master fader to the left and just start with my kick to the far left. And then my clap one, clap two, cowbell one, cowbell two. Um, I think I might go for, I think I see shakers kind of as like a hat, like what a hi-hat would do. So I'm going to actually do this a little bit different. I'm going to go shakers there, cowbells, congas, and then triangle on the end. There's no right order. I'm just trying to think about it in order of how I want to mix. I know I want to start with the kick because it's the meat of the track and I want to go from there. The claps play the part of like a snare. So that's why those are a second in line. So here we go. Just going to try to get a good volume. Now, again, the only thing with this is that I normally would be mixing hotter, but I don't want this to clip my output for what you all are listening to so I'm going to be very careful okay I think that might be loud enough for your ears sorry if it's too loud sorry if it's too soft 
but that's just me guesstimating. just feeling it out I'm really just feeling it in my chest and my ears just in my body feeling the relationship between this kick and these claps now these claps here are like the reinforcing claps and so I want these to be behind this clap to reinforce the realness the humanness but I definitely want these other claps out front alright that's good enough shake a one shake a two Now, because I have three shakers, I'm actually looking forward to playing with a little bit of panning because of the fact that I have three shakers. And I can kind of put them in different places in the spectrum so that in addition to what you're getting ready to hear, which is that they are polyrhythms, um, they're contrasting with each other as far as how they're interweaving. Me putting them in different parts of the spectrum, left to right, uh, is going to also allow you to feel that even more how they're playing off of each other okay, I like that and this is the quiet one that's supposed to just reinforce. It's just that. But if you notice, and this is a good place to demonstrate this. I didn't do this in the last video. If I take it out, I mean, it feels good. It's fine. But watch when I put it in and then you get used to it and then I take it out. It's going to feel like something is missing, even though it's a small part. So this is out. And then this is in. I'm gonna let it play for about 10 seconds. Now I'm gonna take it out. Three, four. Feels like something's missing. That's why I like to write little nuanced parts like this. This wasn't, again, if you followed the last video, I took a completely different approach to Shakers than the original track. You should go check it out if you haven't seen it already. I think it'll give some good creative ideas for how to approach songs when you want to duplicate something but also put your own flavor. Yeah, so if you notice, when I take this out, it feels like something missing. And it is. There's a shaker missing. But also because of the rhythm. I mean, it gives a, a subtle rhythm. So I'm just going to sneak this up in there. Not make it loud, but make it reinforcing. First, I'm going to make it loud so I can hear it and then come back from there. I love that. I love that so much. Especially because when I put a little bit of panning on it and you feel it kind of coming from one side while the other bounces off the other side and then there's one in the middle, oh, it's just going to feel really nice. Get some cowbell. I'm 
feeling like I can give this a little bit more volume. Again, I apologize if that's too loud. Because I can't really control it. So that's cowbell one. And I don't want this to stick out too much. Because even though it's characteristic of the go-go style. But cowbell can easily get on your nerves. Have two cowbells playing off of each other. I'm going to do the same thing where I do a little bit of panning. And then congas. If you notice, there's already some panning going on here. Notice the higher conga is playing more towards the left ear. The lower is more towards the right ear. That's just how the patch was. I like that. Triangle. Too loud. <laughs> oh, way too loud. Okay, so there's one thing I want to actually do with this triangle. I want to take this small hit. If you listen to the last video, I talked about how less is more and how um, you can have disasters like train wrecks with triangles. And I'm, I, that might be the name of it. I, I called it, um, what did I say? Some I forgot what I said, but I actually think I just come, came up with a better name <laughs> for what the video series might be called. Train wrecks with triangles. Collisions with click tracks or tra train works with triangles. Um, I was talking about how you can easily overdo triangles and they can be annoying. Um, and I've heard a lot of examples, even in hit songs where I'm like, oh, my goodness, why didn't anybody hear this? But um, I'm going to talk about those in a future video. For right now, I made the triangle sparse one right there. Boom, a long one there, a short one here. And a long one now this is perfect but there's one thing i want to do and it's actually accentuating this beat here the cowbell um let me, let me sing along with this so you can hear three four, one bop 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 oh i'm sorry um bop 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 i want to accentuate these two beats bop bop i want to do those two beats I want the triangle. I've already copied it. I've copied one of the small. I'll do it again so you can see me. I'm copying the small hit right there. I just want that small hit. I did more than one bar just, just because I'm so used to allowing for the decay of the sound. So that's why it's uh, not one bar, but why it's longer than just this one short piece, even though I only need that. This is just in case there is sound behind it. You, I'm used to sounds being like that, so it's just automatic. And I want to put it here on this beat, and I want to put it here on that beat. Now listen to this. That was too early. Um, I know what happened. We don't have our... See if somebody can guess. It's because I'm looking at a 16th note grid, and what do we need? If you watched the last lesson, you know... That 16th notes were too straight, and we were dealing with a swang. And with a swang, 
that means we're dealing with triplets, 16th note triplets. So I need to change this grid to 16th note triplets. Remember I was talking about the little number three that you would see sometimes. And then that, because I, I was looking at that, because at first this looked like it was on an offbeat, but it was because the grid was looking at 16th and not 16th note triplets. So now it sounds like this. But, but, bang, one, two, one, and two, and three, and four. There we go. Now, let me let you hear that whole bar. And this is just to accentuate that because I think it's a nice rhythm. What I'm going to do is then I'm going to take all this, make a new file out of it, and then copy that over 30 times so that can play the whole track that way. So, think three, four, ding, long, short, think two shorts. Think, think, long. Hear that? Think, think, ding. Okay. Now I'm going to highlight this. I'm hitting Shift, Option, and 3. That's the shortcut for making a new file. And then, now I just need to, instead of having that other pattern, now I'm going to just copy this over 30 times, and now we got a new pattern there. This is what I was explaining earlier about, like, first first ending this is a first ending and then this is a second ending and the both of the patterns are very similar this just has one little extra thing that lifts the beat and something that small can you know mean a world of a difference okay so next up panning So I'm just going to take a couple instruments and do some panning. The first one is dealing with these shakers. Okay. So here's my philosophy. This is shaker two, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's the beat. That's shaker two. Here's shaker one. Two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, and one, two, and three. Okay, and then here's shaker three. Now, what I'm going to do in listening to these three patterns, shaker two has the most foundational rhythm to me. Let me put it against the kick so you can hear it. Da, 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 da. It's it's a cross. Let me look at the actual information, the the wave file. So it's it's a cross. You know the entire pattern, and oh wait, a minute, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Looking at kick. Sorry. Okay, down here. If you notice, out of all three, this one holds down the most hits across the pattern. This one is the most sparse, and then this is the filler. I'm going to make this be in the center, like as far as panning. It's going to be in the center of the mix because to me it's the most foundational part. Even though I laid this part down first, but this part has the most foundational part. And what I mean by foundation is like it plays through the whole pattern and it's just like a solid reoccurring part. This part is more sparse. It's nothing here until like the middle of the bar. So I'm going to pan this probably left a little bit. And then pan this right a little bit so there's these two patterns bouncing off of each other in different ears. And then this one in the middle. Let's see how it feels and how it sounds. I'm going to keep the kick on for just a timing reference. So I'm going to pan this slightly left. And if you are listening in two speakers or either headphones then you heard this move if you're only listening in one speaker or or just mono then you wouldn't have heard that okay now i'm going to take this one and pan it slightly right so now you hear this rhythm 
a little bit on the right. You hear this on the left. It makes them more distinguished. Which actually sh shows, it demonstrates more their varying rhythms. It makes them, um, it brings out the beauty of the rhythms a little bit more. Because you can hear them more distinct than just stacking on top of each other in the middle of the mix. Now let me mute this. Mute this too. Then put the foundation in the middle. So that's what panning is for. It, it does a good job of spreading out the mix isolating things you know showing the beauty of their part because they're not just jammed up with it if everything is stacked on top of each other in the middle of a mix then it's one dimensional this is how you bring more dimension so other than this i think let me listen to these cowbells and see if i want to do the same thing So this is a little bit of a tough one because, okay, by this pattern being so reoccurring, it's a, it's a perfect pattern. It doesn't get on your nerves. And I mean, it's pretty consistent and it, and it's uh, really relevant to this style of go-go. Now I was going to take these and separate them, put one left, put one right. But the issue for me here is this again, I think in foundation to me, this is a foundational part and it's happening so much that if I do this, then it's going to just bug your left ear to death. <laughs> I think that if I just keep it up the middle, then because it's such a reoccurring part, it just it, it's a bit more balanced. And so this part is less occurring, reoccurring. You know, it's a silent. And then there you got a couple hits. So what I think I'm going to do is this triangle. I think I'm going to actually bounce off of this as far as like uh, put one on one side, put one on another side um, just to create some contrast between the triangle and the second cowbell and leave this cowbell in the middle. So it's holding down the middle. So let me do that together. So. I'm right. I'm right eared. <laughs> I'm right handed. So I, I think the same kind of plays for my ear. Like I favor my ear more right. My more, my right ear more than the left. So I think I'm going to throw the triangle a little right. I'm going to turn it down a little bit because I don't want it to get it on my nerves or. And now we got contrast. And this really works as well because in go-go, you know, if you're, if you're listening to a go-go band, they might be a pretty big band. So they're not going to be all piled up on each other in the middle of a room even. You know, they're going to be spread out. And since there's so many different counter rhythms, you know, this is the way to bring them out. So I like that. And I think the volumes work pretty well. So next we have, we did volume and panning. Next we have EQ and compression. So the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead. I'm holding down the option button in Pro Tools. And I think this is for other recording software too. I'm holding down option because whatever I select here is going to copy across all the channels. Um, uh, and actually, I won't be able to do this. Well, I'll do it, but it won't copy for everything. Oh, I guess it did. Let me see. Why did I do that? Because I didn't think it was going to do it because I was selecting mono. But it obviously worked. With some plugins, if, you know, a mono version of it doesn't work on a stereo track. But I guess with these, um, the Waves EQ, this Renaissance EQ, I guess it, it's fine. 
Okay, so I'm going to do the same thing for, well, I'll just, I'll just leave that there for a second so we can just look at one thing at a time. And all I'm going to do is just go through and season to taste. So I'm going to find whatever I feel is the most beautiful aspect of the sound or the part of the sound that I really want to stick out or the, you know, that defines the character. I'm going to get rid of anything I don't think defines the character. And that's it. Just kind of carve it out that way. Starting with the kick. So, let's see. So I would, I would, and I think I'm still going to do this actually. I'm going to roll off a little bit at the top. Yep. That way it can leave more room for other instruments that's up top. Because I don't, I don't really need the top of the kick that much. I just need the thump of it, the mid, mid section of it. I am going to. I am gonna get the point, the point of it, like the the actual attack. It's about it's there in that range. I am gonna bring that out a bit. Probably three decibels. And then we'll use this cue to tighten it up. So that's not raising all the frequencies, but just that, just that one area that I want. Like about there. Okay. I think, let me see how I feel about the mid range. I think I'm gonna get a little bit of this mid range out of there. Now remember, we don't want to mix in a vacuum too long. So I don't want to keep the sound isolated too long while well, I'm going to be mixing just like as if I'm mixing a song that's only kick. <laughs> but it's not. I got to listen to how it, you know, compare, how it uh, fits in with the other instruments as I'm EQing. <laughs> Because you might find that mixing something in isolation like that makes it perfect until you listen to all the other instruments and then it just doesn't fit right. You didn't, you didn't, uh, you know, put it in relationship to the other ingredients. Okay, I'm going to leave that as that. And then I'm looking forward to putting a compressor on here so I can tame this kick a little bit more so that it's better it better sits in the mix it's a pretty hot clap there i might even turn this down a little bit Let's see can't wait to put compression on that too i really could have gone compression first but i'm gonna just stay here so with this clap I'm going to remove any low, a bunch of low information. This is me removing like any low mud information because the clap needs to be crisp and more so mid and upper range. I don't really need the lows, so I'm making room for my kicks and any other information with lows like the congas. So let's go there. Now I'm tempted to bring up this range. This is the range that brings out like the clarity and the clap. But the only thing is I know I'm going to boost this at the end on the master fader about a decibel at least. So I got to be very cautious because I don't want to overdo it. So believe it or not, I'm literally only going to do like 0.3 decibels. And that's it. And I'm going to take some mid range out. Just a little bit of mid range to make it a little bit clean, cleaner, and that's it. So here, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This little trick again that I talked about before in the last um, click track, the first track that I did. Check out um, how to produce a click track, episode one, and. Um, with realistic claps, I like to bring out the sound that's right in the middle of your palm. 
it, that has a tone there. I guess a tone right there. And I like to find that tone in the EQ and bring that out. So that's what I'm going to do. Right there. It's the right there. Now, if you notice, look at how much. I don't know if you saw that, but look at how much this jumped up. Like I'm going to take this back. Look at where it is here, and then watch when I put this in. It it almost peaks, and that's because that really is where the meat of the clap is. I don't need it that loud. I just want more more attention to that because that's the part that's going to peek his head out. And like in the last tutorial, um, when we were producing this, I was saying that I like to boost this area because you hear that fleshy part of the hand, the middle. And that's how we clap. We clap toward the middle of our hands. And especially the more excited we get and the louder we want to clap, we really hit the middle of that palm, make that pop sound. If a person hears that in a track, even subtly, it makes you want to clap. So that's why I'm bringing out that. So let me let me overdo it first again. See, it's not this range. Our claps are not that high pitch unless you're a kid. But if you're an adult, it's more it's more there like there and i don't want to go crazy with it but i do want to just boost that much there we go save always save every couple of minutes even though your program will auto save so that's hotter already with that and the only thing i want to do from here is just compress so i can mellow this stuff out a little bit but for right now so you know a lot of times when I get the instruments like this I just don't really have too much need or desire it'll be taken care of in my overall um, master fader EQ so for right now I'm just gonna leave that there Now I'm going to bring out the sweeping aspect, like that broom sweep aspect of this. So let's first find out where it is. So a lot of it is up here. I don't want this. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is honestly, I'm just... So let, me, let me do this a different way. Yeah, see? Actually, I might do it this way because when you raise this up, if you notice, it causes a dip here, but I'm going to add that back anyway at the end of the mix. So, I want that sweepy sound, that high pitch, those high pitch frequencies. So, I'm actually going to boost this like Three. So you're gonna compare. Sorry, bypass. See, that's brighter. That's duller. Or more dull. I'm gonna boost it up more. Yep. I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm just gonna do that. As a precautionary measure, I always just kind of, any sound where I don't need the low end, even if it doesn't seem like there's anything there, to me this is just a way of tidying up, just in case, you know, just in case your ear can't hear anything, you're cleaning up your, your mix. So, like I don't, that's too high, like about here is good, just, just cleaning it up. To me, this is the same thing. I want to boost up the highs. 
and then clean up the lows. Take a little bit of this mid range out. Mm. So this is one of those places where I want to see if you can hear this. So this shaker has a tone. I just sung it already because my ear just jumped on it. But here's the tone. La, 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 la. Like whatever that tone is on the piano. La, that's actually that tone. And it's in this mid range here. That's why I'm boosting it up because you can really hear it. And I wanted to take it out of there so it sounds more like an in an atonal. Shh, 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 shh. See that? Now it's gone. If your ear is really good, la, you can hear that that tone there. And then when I do this, it sounds more like it's just sweeping. That's what I want. More of a sweeping tone and not not an actual pitch. Like not an actual tone. I can still hear it, but it's definitely that's just because I'm listening to it by itself. I mean, together with the track, it just sounds like. Ch -ch -ch. So far, it feels good. Next up, cowbell. So the tone of that cowbell is there. The only issue with this is that it's playing, you know, and this is what I'm going to show you all in the triangle travesty video. <laughs> Tragic triangles video. Um, this this is sounding so much over and over. Dun, 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 that after a while, if it's if I accentuate the tone of it, that la too much, like it'll sound like it'll make the track it'll conflict with the key that the other instruments are in because it'll sound like it's creating its own key center its own scale um while the other instruments are in a different key so i don't want it to be too loud even though it's kind of acceptable in gogo -Go. i mean it's it's in another style of music, it's kind of acceptable you just don't want to go crazy with it what i really want more is here because you can hear the stick clearly hit the cowbell. And that's what I want more than anything, to be honest. So I'm gonna give that a significant boost, and then I'm gonna narrow down the range because I just want that sound. I just want what's happening here. You hear the stick more here, hit the cowbell. It accentuates the tone, but that's you can't get around that. And that's it for that. Let me, let me listen to one more thing. Yeah, I don't, see, there's no information up here. If you notice, that's not really doing much. So, I don't. Really, I did one dB, but I don't really need anything more than that. This is kind of the same way, where the hit of the stick. Is like about here around around this and I'm saying here not as an up and down here as in left to right like as far as my EQ range the 2k range you know is where I'm hearing this stick hit so I'm gonna give that a significant boost now you can use these techniques even if you're not like mixing your track if you're just doing this because this is from a musical perspective how you want the sounds to sound so mixing techniques are good even for just production there's a lot of times you'll choose a sound that's really close but maybe you just need it to sound a, a particular way as far as the eq or compression and you can use it in a musical way so that's it i'm gonna just give it like four and a half db of increase and then that's it now you can hear more of those the percussive aspect of it ok 
Okay. Same way here. This is accentuating the hand, the sound of the hands hitting it. It's brighter. And what's going to happen is because I keep doing this to each one of those tracks, overall, the whole track is just going to sound way more percussive and rhythmic. And I didn't even add any instruments or play any more parts. It's just I brought out the percussive aspects of each sound. And in these cases, it's like the hand hitting the drum or the stick hitting it. Give it a little bit more. Make it a little bit more live. So that's that's a bit. That's a lot. Let me show you a comparison. Here's with that range boosted where you hear the hands hitting hear the slap and then here's without it here's with it and then here's without it it's very subtle it took me years to hear this there might be some people that's listening like I really don't hear a difference but it does, uh, you know, the more you listen over time and the more you do this, your ears will eventually hear. I can hear differences of 0.5 dB, and it took a while to hear. Like, 0.5 dB is like me speaking like this, and me speaking like, well, let me see, me speaking like this, and me speaking like this. <laughs> and it sounds the exact same, but it's not, there's a decrease in volume. Now, I need this low information here because the tone of the conga is still down in this range. So if I do this, now I'm losing the most important part of my conga. So I'm not going to do that. But I am going to roll off below those ranges because I don't need it, but so boomy. And there we go. Bright, I'm going to brighten up the top a little bit. That's it. Now all of a sudden this track feels more alive just with those few touches. And this, I mean, honestly, there's nothing I want to do to this. I'm going to do this. Just, just for that high, those high pitch frequencies. Just so it like rings and shines a little bit more. But honestly, I don't want to go crazy with this. Because that this can easily get out of hand and just irritate your ear. So 1.5 decibels is all I'm going to do. And that's it. I don't even need to roll off. Because there's clearly nothing down there in the lower range with this sound. Okay, I feel good with that. Next up, compression. Sorry, next up, compression. And for those that don't know, just a little refresher while I pull up the plugin. I'm pulling up a, a Waves C1 compressor. The funny thing is I'm very minimalistic because I have the entire Waves um, plugin package. You see all of these other, all of these other things. And to be honest, and then you got your UAD plugins, and I love this stuff. But I'm I like I'm a person that likes to spend more of my time in production and making music than mixing. So the funny thing is, out of this whole list, I literally only use like four plugins on this list, and this is one of them. <laughs> the others I'll be using more in the future, but I'll be using them more for musical um, taste than mixing because I don't actually really like the tedious process of mixing. Not not enough to where all I want to do is sit down and mix. I just like to make the sound better for the song, make it more listenable, and then I'm ready to make some more music. <laughs> so what we're trying to do with compression is to control the sound so that they are a little bit more tamed, where they're still live, they're still, they aren't restricted, but where they're a little bit more cohesive. Um, some sounds, when you hit them, 
when you hit them in different velocities or with different amounts of strength, you know, they'll be soft and they'll be very loud and everything in between. And you don't want your track having that kind of all over the place volume. You want consistency. So that's where the compression comes in. So what I like to do with this compressor is what I call chopping off the top. This is almost like if you have grass and like there are some blades that are even and nice and then there's some that's growing wild. Like you just, if this arrow was like a, a, some hedge cutters or, you know, a trimmer, then it would just trim all of the hedges, all of the grass to just stop right here, which would make it neater overall. It would actually make it a more tamed lawn. <laughs> and that's exactly what we're doing with a lawnmower. I, that's how I look at um, compressors, just like digital lawnmowers. So I'm going to bring this down here. And what this is going to do is make the kick thump, but just be more controlled. I think I'm going to take about that much off the top. And so I want to set my ratio. Usually I like to do around 1.25 to 1. I just find that to be a good, decent number. That feels good. So if you notice, it's kind of restricting the kick a bit. is actually bringing it down at least four decibels, which is what I want. So I'll bring it down just a little bit more. Okay. So now with this, I'm gonna leave the release fast cause I want the compressor to let go fast cause these kicks are pretty sparse. They have some space in between. I'm gonna leave the attack where it is. And to be honest, Okay. If you notice now, let me let me bypass this. So this was before. Somebody might say, man, it's more thumping that way. And then this is after. See, it's quieter. It feels like it lost its energy. It feels like it lost its energy. It did decrease by four decibels, so that's a lot. But here's the beautiful trick. The beautiful part about uh, compression is this right here. After you set it in a good way to chop that top off and keep it, you know, real tame, then this makeup volume right here allows you to put back what you lost or any amount that you want. I always like to um, let me let me do that from the jump. I always like to add like at least half of what's coming out. So in this case, four. So I, I usually add like two, maybe 2.5 back into the sound. And what it's doing is it's taking that uh, that compressed sound that's more controlled and lifting the entire sound up to more, you know, 2.5 more decibels. What that does is you have a, a kick that's thumping, but again, it's just more controlled. Sometimes what I do is I'm happy with that makeup gain there. And then if I want more volume, just overall in the track, then I'll just come here. So I feel good with that. Next up, clap. Same thing. I want these claps to pop and sound good, but I just want them to be a little bit more controlled. Now here's a place where, let's see, 2.7, I'm gonna give it a decibel. If you heard that, you heard it come back up in volume, but it's just more controlled. So believe it or not, this allows your sound to pop more.
this one I'm not going to attack as hard because it's not as intrusive. But you see the difference in volume. Sometimes it didn't even reach up here on those last two hits. So I'm going to do a light version of this. I'm not going to do any makeup game. Or maybe I'll do, I'll do um, a half a dB. Let you hear these by themselves. Now I could do more. Again, you know, if I was really good at putting a bunch of limiters on these, I mean, I could really put some other limiters and make it really pop. But, you know, it's kind of like being a cook and being good with certain ingredients and others you're not. You don't want to just start dumping things in because you can't reverse it if you screw it up. You can reverse it here, but you still wind up getting yourself into a big mess and then you don't, you know, you have a hard time finding your way back to what sounded good and then your ear gets fatigued and then before you know it, you don't even know if what you're listening to sounds good or not. Like, it is crazy. So, less is more. I try to keep it minimalistic. So, next up, we have these shakers. And to be honest, I don't think these shakers really actually even need a lot of compression. So, I'm just going to do a simple light touch literally like one ten to one which is really light i'm judging this by ear so these numbers they don't mean anything to me other than just remembering what they sound and feel like when i start adjusting so i can't break down the math to you i just know that this is a ratio um to one and the higher you you know the higher your ratio the more compressed the sound is Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to add any makeup game. I'm going to go to the next one, see if it's... I'm going to do the same thing. It's just a light. Just something to catch it when it gets a little out of control. Lightly, mildly. And that's it. I'm going to... I'm probably going to... I'm going to add half a dB back here because it's my main shaker. I want it to be real present. And I heard that too. That cut up a good amount. This here. I honestly am not going to compress this at all. Because it's so small of a sound. Matter of fact, let me just do it this way. Let me let me let me go ahead and do what I've been doing to the other ones. And give it a boost back. So that, that really actually equals not really compressing it. Well, it doesn't equal not compressing it. it. Equals compressing it, but just making it almost be where you don't, where it's not really a difference from where it was, except for mathematically, it's a small difference. It's it's being tightened up. This is the one I know I want to compress a little bit because, again, this can really get on your nerves after a while. So the best thing to do is to put some light compression on it. I'm not going to add back anything. I'm going to add back here, which is not really adding back at all. It's just taking the overall sound up just a hair. And that was from 20.1 to 19.5, which is just really a half a dB. don't want this to get on your nerves okay second cowbell and this is one that I definitely don't want to bother too much because it's not really intrusive even though it is playing kind of loud there I mean it's coming way up here almost to zero but it's because it's overall a loud sound but it's not intrusive to me though so 
so I'm gonna leave that there. No makeup gain on that because it's still loud enough to me. Definitely want to put some compression on the congas because slaps are definitely different volumes each time. So light compression. And I'm just going to add back a decibel. Now, here's one place where I'm going to increase the release. The release is pretty much what it says is how fast the compressor lets go and goes back to normal to wait for the next sound to come through. I'm going to increase the release because anytime I'm dealing with a sound where it's playing very frequently, like one sound after the other, you kind of get to the point where like if I do this real high, you notice it's not doing it well where you can see it, but like the compressor is taking a long time. I'm not going to do anything near that much, but I just wanted to say that when you have multiple hits back to back, and if you're trying to control the sound, then you want to take the release higher um, so that it takes longer for the sound to release. And then that way the compressor is still active. So that way, if there's another loud sound that comes through back to back, with another it doesn't get through because your compressor hasn't quite let go yet so like here I'm just going to put it at 100 I already boosted it a dB and I feel good with it Um, as a mixing engineer or, you know, whatever you call yourself, even if, you, even if you're not fully an engineer, but you're just doing this to add a nice polish to your songs, you're going to notice that, I mean, you can mix forever. You're always going to find something where you're like, ah, it could be better. You have to be able to let it go at some point because what I found, and they taught us this in school, I mentioned it in a previous video, they taught us how to, you know, spend time mixing and then they taught us how to they taught us how to spend long lengths of time and also short, quick mixes because you have to be able to get in and get out and commit to things and let them go and not be overly perfectionist about it. And it's easy to be that way, but it doesn't work in your favor because you're dealing with your ear. So after a while, your ear is fatigued and that's before you even realize it a lot of times. So you might be boosting highs. You might be boosting highs in your uh EQ at some point for a sound that you've been listening to for an hour and the reason why you're boosting those highs is because your ear is so tired that you don't even hear the highs as well anymore so it seems like the highs aren't there and you're boosting them but it's because of an you know an oral illusion so quick mixes allow you to commit to things fast and also I found personally that whether I spend six hours on a mix or two hours it usually winds up sounding about the same and i've also found that i could slave over a mix and then when i and, and i can hear like these real small nuances that just bug me but then when i get when i take a break and then i get in a car and listen i mean you just don't even hear it like if you've had a good sounding mix that you've been you know overly perfectionist about and just anal about you'll find that once you listen to it in another environment where you're not as focused in in your headphones and in your perfect studio like it, it you don't even hear it it just it sounds fine and those places where you thought it was such a big difference in one small change it, you just don't hear it you know you you hear it to some degree if you're a good engineer but you start realizing that the mix sounds way better than you thought you know and that's just always the case so yeah, minimalistic mixing is where it's at. So anyway, we're on the last sound here. Triangle. And this one, I'm definitely going to apply a good amount of compression because the sound by itself is already pretty hot. And I think that's because when I exported it from Logic, I allowed it to normalize, which means that it boosted you know, the, the sound as hot as it could go, 
which is fine actually i mean i kind of want that for this but i also don't want it to get on my nerves so it took out two decibels i'm gonna add add one back and we're done okay so to be honest overall i am pretty much done with this mix the only thing that i'm going to do the only thing i'm going to do at this point is i'm going to put a little bit of reverb on this track just a hair i'm always careful about reverb because for the for a track like this more than likely the client is going to use this in a live environment and if you're in a live environment you're going to have natural acoustics anyway so i always like to err on the lighter side when it comes to reverb because if you're in a reverberant place and you have a bunch of reverb on the track then i mean you know you can't do anything about it but if you have no reverb on a track and you're in a reverberant place then it's perfect um yeah, it's just a less is more kind of thing. You know, it's it's one of those things. I think this analogy might, you know, link up. It's like when you look at um, hot versus cold, you could always put more clothes on to be warmer, but you can only take but so much off, you know. And if you take off all your clothes and it's still hot, like you can't do anything about that, but you can always put on more clothes. So that's kind of how I look at it in this way i mean you can't if there's already a bunch of reverb on it and there's reverb in the environment you can't do anything like you can't take it off but if there's no reverb or little reverb then your environment can add on more um or if you are also a producer or engineer you can drop it right in your program and just add some uh reverb on yourself so i'm gonna put a little bit of reverb on here just for a little bit of a fullness especially with the claps because the claps echoed in the original and I want to give them a little bit of an echo. But uh, again, I'm going to be mindful of the fact that this track may be played or more than likely played in multiple environments. And some of those environments are going to be really reverberant. And so you rather have a drier than, you know, wetter mix. So I'm going to create an arc track because that's how you route your uh, reverbs where you get, I'm sorry, that's how you get route your sounds to your reverb. And I'm going to do this, which is holding down command and hitting solo. So that way I always hear it um, throughout the whole mix. And I'm going to throw an R verb. It's the only reverb I use out of all these reverbs. I actually use the air sometimes up top. Um, but I'm going to throw this on there and I'm actually going to use a plate. I find plates to be like the the safest reverb because they just they add a shine onto the sound more than just like a big hall or big room sound. They add like a, a shine onto the sound that gives you some reverb. But yeah, it's, it's just not a, a huge room. So. I want to just call this verb, not verb V, verb, and then I'm going to, let me see, I think I got a, what is this? Okay, yeah, so this is my plate setting. I just called up a setting that I have. Let me, let me go back though, because I need to show the process. So um, I'm going to do factory default. I'm basically going to go to plate one because it's a short plate and I want the reverb to not be as loud and long I'm just judging because I know how this will sound but I'll put it into play and with the damping I don't want a, a, a whole lot of low information so I always bring this down just a little bit so that way it's not as much low information coming through the EQ as it is high information okay from here i'm just going to take first the clap clap one 
And if you notice, this already has reverb on it because I put it on it before. So I'm going to add a little bit more to that. I'm going to add a little bit more to this clap. And what else do I want in this? To be honest, I really think... I honestly think that might be I'm gonna add maybe hmm I'm trying to see if I want to add any onto these shakers. The problem with shakers is that once you start adding reverb, especially when they're hitting relatively frequently like how these are the reverb starts to carry the sound over and create like a wash and i don't really want to wash because these are separate distinct sounds and i want you to hear the distinct rhythms so i honestly think i'm going to leave reverb off of everything except for maybe i might put a little on these congas so i'm going to do the claps and I'm going to do the congas. Just a little bit of reverb. Just a little. Okay. I'm going to use bus one and two. And using bus one and two here. Um, for those that don't know, just so I can make sure. I know I'm doing a lot and I'm doing a lot of moves that you might not be familiar with if you're a beginner. The bus allows you to take the sound from this channel to put it on a bus, like a bus line, and to bring it here to this input and it allows it to it allows you to send sound to a particular channel um, without going like through all the other channels and definitely without going through the master fader first so these are like little secret tunnels that's kind of how I look at it secret tunnels to get from one place to another in a track and to you know in this case, we needed to get to the reverb, but we don't need to go through every other sound or through the main outputs until after it hits the reverb. So let's first solo this. And now I'm just going to start bringing the volume up on this, the amount of sound that I'm sending to the reverb. And you're going to start hearing a reverb. Hear that? So this is before and this is afterwards. Hear that? It's pretty loud. And I really just want this much because, let's see. I think that's a good amount there. No reverb except for what was already on there. And then. I think I want to put it like right there. Yep. What it's doing is it's, it's giving a tail onto the sound that's really reminiscent of the original track. And I actually want to boost this up a little bit too. As far as volume, I'm going to boost it up. Take it down just a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> so that's one. Here's the second one. Notice this already has a little bit of a room reverb. You can tell that's in a space already. So I'm adding to that. Giving it a tail again like the other one. Adding to the overall tail of the clap section. I think that's it. Pretty long tail there. 
I'm listening to how long it takes for the car to like decay totally. And it's pretty long, but it works actually in this. feels a bit loud to me you know gonna go right back down to where i started <laughs> and now congas Just a little bit. I don't I actually don't want a lot on this. pretty much done to be honest i really feel happy with that i really feel happy so the only thing from here is that i'm gonna put some effects on my overall master fader and then we're done so what i want to do is i'm going to first put a eq on my master fader because one of the things that is kind of a staple for most tracks is that between 2 and 8k really 2 and 4k right here though is what we call the um the intelligibility range and this is where you'll notice if something sounds let me see if I do this with my other hand so if something sounds muffled like this and it sounds pretty good. In fact, let me do it this way. If something sounds muffled like this, where it sounds pretty good, but because you've been listening to my voice, you can hear that there's something over my mouth, which in this case is my hand. But as soon as I remove my hand, then all of a sudden it sounds clearer, less clear, less clear, less clear, and clearer. That's what this range does when you start to give it a little bit of boost here. And this is even if you already the the beautiful part I like about this is that if you do it right, like I've you notice that in a few of these tracks, I boosted up that range already just slightly. If you do it right, it sounds great like it is. Doesn't sound muffled at all. But that's what I love about this, because it's not. I did a good job with it, which means when I add this little bit of boost right here, it's going to affect because it's on a master fade, it's going to affect all tracks which is going to make the entire track just go from sounding great to all of a sudden even more crystal clear. So did you hear that? So all I did was brighten up the track a bit. Now here's, I'm gonna bypass this and I'm gonna do it musically, so I'm gonna do it in phrases. So this is with it on, much clearer. One, two, three, off. That is amazing to me. Because this sounded great before. One, two, three, on. But that's just, it's like all of a sudden the, t the television came more into focus. The colors are brighter. So off. And now on. So that's what a 
EQ on the master fader will do when you bump up that range. Don't go crazy because you can, and some, and I've done this before in mixes, I've had this all the way up here because it was so clear. I was like, oh my goodness, it's so clear, but it was too, too much higher range. It was too, you know, too much in that clarity range once I listened to it in a car or something, and then it became irritating. So you just want a nice little bump. I did one decibel because that was enough. I did the point three because when you boost the higher end here to get some of those real high um, aspects of the, the sounds, this automatically, if you notice the shape of it, the higher you raise this, the more it dips down the, the uh, range behind it. So I had to make up for it by giving it a couple extra dBs. Then the other little trick in this same, on this same EQ for more clarity is another one where you come to this 500, this 300 to 500 range is always where you have mud. If you're ever dealing with a track that sounds muffly or muddy, take some out of this, this 500 range right here and boost here in your intelligibility range. And you'll notice like, wow, it's a big difference. So I usually take this range here and I usually bring it down a half a dB or one full dB. It just depends on how much I feel like I need to clean up the track. Let me let me take that back to where it was originally. So I'm gonna start lowering it. Cleaning up the track. I'm gonna go for a decibel. Maybe 0.8. I want to put a little bit back. <laughs> so this is another way. This is by adding clarity. This is by taking away mud. And what you'll find when you test them both out, like if you start, if I started here, you would notice just by dropping that, the, the track got clearer because I got out some of the mud. So there's two ways to do that. You know, when I was in school, they taught us first to cut before you boost. So... I just didn't do this first because I'm, I already know the formula, so I already knew I was going to cut here. So I just went on and boosted here and just move from right to left. I kind of read right to left when it comes to mixing. Um, okay, so that's that. And then everything else is fine. I mean, again, you could do this right here. Again, this is cleaning up. You just kind of roll off. This is the frequency right here. You roll off, you know, anything under in this in this track, pretty much anything under 30. I don't need. So it just cleans it up a little bit. Then what I do is add overall compression to the entire mix on this track. Now remember that I use the compression to as like a, a hedge cutter, you know, to cut off the top blades of the grass and make it all even. So the better job you do here, and this is why I spend so much time on volume and panning and then EQ and compression here, because the better job you do there, when you come to your master fader, you should just be waxing. You shouldn't be cleaning the car and, you know, p like really getting out the, the deep stains. You should just be polishing a already really good washed car. <laughs> so that's what this is about. So even when it comes to compression, I try to do a good job across the board of controlling and taming each sound individually. So here I shouldn't have much to deal with. It's just putting a final like layer of protection on top. And this is really before I bring out my limiter to boost everything, you know. So pretty much when I look at this, I saw that really the sound, the loudest sound is the kick drum that's pushing it right here pushing it right up right up to that bar so I'm just apply a little bit of compression here where I just take it down you see that 0.4 0.5 it's not even much I really can come down more yeah I'm gonna come down more like about there just you know, 1.10 to 1. And that's just knocking off the top. Just taming the top a little bit more. Now, with this, 
I'm not going to add any makeup gain because again, at this point, the makeup gain is going to come from this, this little guy right here, this L2 ultra maximizer. This is, this is a compressor, but it's what we call a brick wall limiter. Um, so it compresses the sound, but instead of just like gently pushing it down and giving it some room to come back up, this is completely it's what its name is it's a it's a limiter it says ultra maximizer here too because that's another way of saying it it maxes my it maximizes the sound of the overall volume by severely limiting you know the the, the sound coming past a f certain threshold if you limit the sound from coming past a certain threshold altogether like literally putting a ceiling on it then you can raise the overall volume to max because it'll never cross that threshold this is like the good guy and the bad guy because this one device here, if you don't know already, this one device here is what causes what we call loudness wars in the industry. And that is, you know, in popular music like uh, pop and hip hop and R&B, the goal for, is for the sound to be as in your face as possible, as big as possible and as in your face as possible, because usually it's about dancing or, you know, something where it's like higher energy um i don't i hate it like i i get it and i understand it for certain mixes but i like dynamics better so i don't like really loud and in your face mixes all the time only for certain stuff but it gets on my nerves after a while because you can't get your ear away from it and i don't listen to pop regularly so my ears are not accustomed to hearing that much volume pumped at you you know through these maximizers I listen to jazz and some other dynamic music, you know, where it's really it's OK to be quiet for it to be really quiet. So anyway, with that being said, like this is a great tool right here and it can be pushed to the to the limit as well to where it's not good. But it's like any other tool. So all I'm going to do here is this is the out ceiling. Zero is unity gain. That's, you know, where you want your sounds to stop. In school, we learn to just make it negative 0.1 just for mathematic, mathematical purposes to make sure like an extra <laughs> bit of protection. So it's just something I do, you know, just by uh, nature. And then you lower the threshold. Now, I'm not going to be able to do this, but so much because it's going to blast off your ears. So I'm just going to bring it down a bit so you can hear the difference. But. What we're doing is we're making a ceiling so that the sound never passes negative point one. And then I'm taking the threshold, the ceiling, and I'm bringing it down to where it's it's forcing the sound. To, it's making the sound sound like it's louder, but it's really just because I am I'm adding to the sound by bringing the threshold down and raising the entire um, sound up. I'm going to have to find in a future video another way of explaining it where you can see it in a better demonstration because here you can't see it. It's just kind of something that I know from using it. So if you notice here, it sounds good, but as soon as I do this, it's going to get louder and louder. See that? And it actually sounds good because it's like it's making the whole mix, the whole, I'm sorry, the whole mix bigger. <laughs> It makes the it's making the whole mix bigger. Um, yeah. And so at some point I can't do it here, um, but at some point it'll be so big that you'll start seeing the, the, the maximizer kick in because it'll start attenuating the sound and pushing it down. But for right now, I'm just going to stay here so you can hear like here's a finished mix with a bigger sound where we're going. And then once I stop this, I'm just going to tweak it a little bit farther where it's not blasting off anybody's ears. And then that's it. But this is what it'll sound like. That's it. There's only one more thing I'm going to do here. And that's just to show you once you finish your mixes, you want to throw a dither plug in on the 
the master fader. I usually do it as the last plugin. And what this is, this is literally just has to do with math. Um, when you're bouncing down your mix, it, you're going to lose a uh, certain quality because of the fact that you have to bounce it down as far as bit rate. So putting a dither plug in, you can't, again, this is, it's hard. It's so hard to explain. It says noise shaping. You're not going to hear anything. It's going to put it in the mix and it's going to make up the mathematical difference for what you lose by, you know, bouncing down your mix and bouncing it down at a lower rate. So this mix is, I'm recording at 24, um, 48, but I'm going to bounce it down to 1644 because that's the standard for listening to MP3s. That means that it loses some quality, but this dither plugin puts it back and it just makes everything all right. So it's really something you just set and forget. You, you, you don't tweak it. You could hit this to turn it off and on, but and you could turn, you could change the bit rate, but everybody, I mean, I never have, I've never used 18 bit in my life or 20. I don't even know why you would. Um, but yeah, you just set it and forget it. So I just wanted to show you that that's the last thing you put on your master fader before you literally hit the export button. So I appreciate you for watching this video. I hope that you got a lot out of it. Um, I feel like I'm getting better at explaining and um yeah it just feels good so drop me a line let me know what you think and as always um you know watch the other videos soak up as much information as possible and if you see fit you can drop a donation um, to help me to make more videos like this so that i can continue to give away as much of this information as possible for free and be able to sustain in the process so thanks a lot have a great day and i'll talk to you in the next video peace in this video i wanted to just jump in here real quick to give some quick information about this video that you're watching it's a part of a larger series that's on my personal brand channel aaron hill tv and it's called mpe tutorials and mpe vlogs it's a series that i'm starting now and soon there will be hundreds of videos because this is a daily process that i want to pull you in on so as you can see, MPE stands for Music Production and Engineering, and the vlogs will be my full length sessions when I sit down on a daily basis and go through these topics as I'm making music and working on different things. The uh, tutorials will be segments pulled from those vlogs for shorter tutorials about how to do specific things. And I want to offer them both to you, but I wanted to let you know they won't be on the performance track channel because the goal is to keep them separate in order to keep them succinct. The performance track channel is more so for backing tracks and lyric videos. And I don't want to bombard that channel with these, even though they'll be useful to some people. So I wanted to tell you that to say, come on over to the Aaron Hill TV channel on a daily basis. Go ahead and subscribe and hit the notifications button because I'll be releasing these regularly. And I'll only have one here or there, a shorter segment of that on the performance track channel, just to let the new people know who come to that channel that this is going on on the other channel. So thanks a lot for, uh, you know, bearing through this. And I hope that you find that helpful. And again, head on over to my channel, Aaron Hill TV, like subscribe and look out for these daily MPE tutorials and daily MPE vlogs. Thanks a lot.